Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Anderson, uh, Chair of the Peace Studies Department. I welcome you today to the 30th Annual Peace Studies Conference titled mm -hmm. Moving Beyond Stereotypes, the Somali Community in Minnesota. I graduated 31 years ago from CSBSJU, and less than two years later, our unbroken string of annual conferences would commence. It would have been helpful for me in the 1980s to better understand issues like Central America, growing inequality that we obviously still talk about today, uh, and the nuclear shadow, which we talk about today as well. Uh, if we had had conferences, especially conferences like this early in the year, uh, that get the focus on these issues. Since 1988, this conference has played an important role in fostering campus discussions of the vital issues of the day. Most of our conferences have drawn on both the academic expertise and the expertise that's gained through lived experience and thoughtful reflection. Today's conference being a perfect example of both. The primary source of our funding has always come from Robert and Lorraine Brighton Booker, both of whom are now deceased, but definitely here in spirit. We're joined this year by the Peace Studies Department, CSB Campus Ministry, Central Minnesota Community Empowerment Organization, the J. Phillips Center for Interfaith Learning, the Eugene McCarthy Center for Public Policy and Civic Engagement, Intercultural and International Student Services, Cultural Bridges in St. Joseph, the CSB SJU Peace Studies Club, and the Initiative Foundation. In addition to this funding, this conference would not have been possible without the vision and the organizing of Dr. Ron Pagnuco and Sheila Hellman, our unstoppable department and program coordinator. In just a moment, CSB President Mary Hinton will welcome you to today's event, all of which will happen in this room. And there are brochures, uh, if you didn't get one yet, that have all the rest of the day's events as well as some web links on the back table back there. Since her arrival at CSB, President Hinton has been a faithful attendee and a supporter of our conference. Her commitment to furthering equity and ending disparities is well recognized in her educational leadership, but it extends far beyond the educational realm. In just three days, President Hinton will receive a bicentennial medal from Williams College, her alma mater, in large part for, quote, her passion for educational equity, end quote. It's a great honor, but little surprise, to see her both receiving this award and welcoming all of us to a day focused on advancing justice and equity in Minnesota. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to President Hinton. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is truly my pleasure to welcome you to the College of St. Benedict for the 30th Annual Peace Studies Conference. This year's theme, Moving Beyond Stereotypes, the Somali Community in Minnesota, is both timely and critically important, and I would argue a part of our mission as a Catholic and Benedictine institution to host and support. To understand the value of this conversation and conference today, we could reasonably look at the demographics of our region. The total number of students of color enrolled in, in pre-K through 12th grade in schools located throughout Stearns County rose by over two and a half times in the 10 year period between 2006 and 2016. And certainly extraordinary and welcome growth by the Somali community led the way. This rich diversity of students and communities makes for a more engaged and lively community, brings more minds and ideas to bear upon, upon problems, brings more solutions to issues, and more opportunity to express our humanity as a community. And certainly at St. Ben's and St. John's, this local growth has provided extraordinary new opportunities to enroll more new and historically underrepresented students, students who contribute to the rich fabric of our community. Yet this opportunity is not entirely new to us at St. Ben's and St. John's, nor is it new to the region. As I shared in a statement to our internal community last spring, 
We have a special and historic relationship with diversity and immigrant communities at St. Ben's and St. John's. You see, when the Sisters of the Order of St. Benedict arrived in St. Joseph in 1863 as immigrants themselves, it was to educate the children of German immigrants. From documents in that time period, we know of the practical exclusion of immigrants from public schools because of physical distance, language barriers, and differences in nationality. So from the beginning of our history in central Minnesota, our mission called us to embrace inclusion and all the people we were to include. Our commitment to community resonates throughout all we do in our community at St. Ben's and St. John's, and it is imperative that each and every day we define and express community in an inclusive Benedictine way that recognizes, appreciates, and supports all. You see, for more than 1,500 years, Benedictines like those that founded St. Ben's and St. John's have recognized the transformative power of community. And at a time when national turmoil and strife is creating dichotomies throughout many facets of community, today's Peace Studies Conference clearly illustrates our human compact with one another. This matters because behind every number I have cited or could cite beats a heart. And for me, the beating heart of another human being is more compelling than just the numbers. So today, our hearts beat together. Today, we will learn together. In the same way that education moves us towards difficult conversations, it's also the only thing that can move us towards peace. We must embrace the tensions and questions that inevitably arise as we challenge the past and look toward the future. We must explore those tensions and mind them for their lessons and allow them to move us into new and better ways of being in the world. At their best, conversations like the one we have today will help entire institutions and communities find and use an improved voice. Conversations like the one we will have today can yield a shared understanding of what is meant by the word community. I also believe that as powerful as our local opportunities and connections are, today's conversation represents a global issue as well. As America considers its place in a changing world, we must remind ourselves of our commitment to global education and internationalization. Without voices and representation from around the globe, we simply cannot fulfill our mission. We seek to create a world where an individuals travel and exchange ideas across borders, across perspectives, and across stereotypes. We seek to create a world where we are all working toward the common good. So thank you, each of you, for being here today. I wish you a successful and illuminating conference, and may we find peace and comfort in our time together. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ibrahim. Uh, first name is I P R A H I M. Last name A B D U L L A H I. Uh, I was born in Somalia in early 90s. Uh, after the civil war broke out in Somalia, uh, that's 1991, my parents took us to Kenya as a refugee. Uh, Kenya accepted us to be a refugee. Uh, and I was there for like 20 years in the world's largest refugee in Kenya called the Dayab Refugee Camp. Uh, I started my schooling there in 1998. 
uh, I went to my primary and secondary education in the CAM. I also went two years college, and after the two years college, and then I joined uh, to be a teacher because I know students are uh, lacking teachers there. So I decided to be a teacher for two and a half years, and then I got this opportunity to settle to United States in the year 2014. Uh, beyond that, today we know we have this conference uh, moving beyond the stereotype, the Somali community in Minnesota. I myself, I know what peace is because I was there, I was in Kenya as Fuji. I've never seen my, my homeland country, Somalia, because of civil war. So I know what peace is. I know how peace important is. Uh, after that, I would like to introduce to uh, these people here. To so start with Huda Ibrahim. She is here. She is a CSP graduate and other of from Somalia to snow, how central Minnesota became home to Somalia. She is the winner of 2016 Five Under 40 Award from the Initiative Foundation and St. Cloud Times. Huda is also a teacher uh, at St. Cloud Technical Community and College. And I personally, she taught me diversity and social justice, where I get an A because of. <laughs> Huda is also a board of member of Central Minnesota Community Empower Organization. I would like to invite Huda to the stage. And before that, each speaker has 15 minutes. So let's please keep time and then go the consequence. Thank you. I thought he, he worked so hard to get that A, but I don't think so now. I'm glad to be here today. Um, it's always good to uh, come back to CSB. Um, uh, this is a place that I call home, really. Um, before I start uh, my um, remarks or presentation, I want to uh, recognize some uh, professors over here um, who taught me and invested in me and encouraged me and empowered me and mentored me and um, make sure that I not only graduate from CSP but also, you know, went to grad school and and came back here and make a difference. Um, first person, <laughs> he he doesn't like to, you know, uh, when I when I mention his name, usually he goes like, okay, don't. But but his name is Professor Ran, and he's all the way back. The back, <laughs> wave Ran, please. When I was getting my American citizenship, I had a class that day, um, and I had Jeff Anderson's class, who's here today, and I told him I'm getting my citizenship today, uh, Prof, um, so I have to go down to the Twin Cities, and he said, go ahead and come back. You will take your um, test later. And I came back waving the American flag and of course, I took the test. So I want to thank uh, Professor um, Jeff Anderson. Please acknowledge him. Um, can you please stand up? I also want to thank uh, Professor Mark Conway. I remember when I was taking his <laughs> um, Creative writing class, you know, um, English is not my first language, so Shakespeare, mm -mm. <laughs> And uh, poetry is even worse. Some of the words couldn't even pronounce. So he made me stand up and actually read it. And although I read it and read it and read it before, you know, you know th that night, the previous night, in the morning I was, you know, we were standing in a circle and I was reading this book and I was thinking, oh my God, 
<laughs> How am I going to pronounce these words? But I did it actually. So uh, of course, uh, a great professor, and he taught me uh, when I took, you know, uh, his classes how to how to write and be a, a better writer. Um, so I want to acknowledge him too, Professor uh, uh, Mark Kenway. Um, he's sitting at the back over there. Please wave at least your hand. <laughs> of course. There are the great uh, professors, uh, Sister Mara Falconer, of course, who's here with us today, and she does a phenomenal job in bringing the people and the community together, so I also want to acknowledge her. And also Jackie, who uh, works at the Academic Advising, and remember, um, I was the only Somali female at the time here. We had a lot of men at that time, and I was struggling at times, you know, and feeling isolated, so when I don't feel good, She's the one who used to say, keep going. So I want to acknowledge her and thank her. Jackie, thank you so very much. <laughs> I briefly want to talk about um, why I wrote this book. And, and I don't want to take so much time. I just want to say a few things as to what inspired me to write from Somalia to snow, um, how central Minnesota became home. Um, I used to get a lot of questions uh, from people, and particularly my colleagues and friends, and they would ask, um, what are the Somali folks' um, lives and struggles, um, you know, like in St. Cloud? Are they contributing to the St. Cloud economy or draining resources from the community? Are they assimilating or trying to impose their culture and religion onto the American mainstream society? So those negative, inaccurate perceptions that Somalis are either taking away jobs or relying on welfare are the factors that encourage me to write this book. I look, so I look into Somalis' economic contribution uh, to central Minnesota and the challenges facing Somalis in businesses and um, also in the workplace. So I wrote this book to basically correct some of the misconceptions about the Somalis in central Minnesota. So that's why and you know I began to write this book and research and talk to people, um, professionals, uh, folks who are students, business owners, um, community members, and so forth, so that our hosted community would understand our culture and not only why we came to Minnesota, uh, in particular St. Cloud, but also what are we doing here? Um, are we contributing to the economy? And of course, yes. I too was born in Somalia and flee a civil war, went to uh, different cities in um, you know, the African continent, like Ethiopia, Kenya. I have lost family members. Um, there were so many uh, issues and problems um, that we faced before coming to the United States of America. And when people came to US, you know, they don't just go to the county and, and ask for handouts. They work hard. Some of our mothers work at night, get off work at 6 a.m., take the kids to school, do laundry and so forth. You know, some of them don't even sleep uh, that much. And they do the same thing over and over, and those mothers may not even have husbands, and they are the ones who are providing for their kids and families. So um, the, this perception uh, was something that uh, I wanted it to uh, confront and, 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 and change that perception. Um, of course, um, I am heavily involved in our uh, community, whether it's businesses. Um, I advise folks uh, who are trying to understand not only our culture, but also the business community, um, we just founded uh, a consultant business uh, on the principle of cultural integration, so we wanted it to help the Somalis integrate uh, into uh, St. Cloud and central Minnesota, understand what's needed when it comes to the business in the United States of America. Uh, we work with companies who also hire uh, Somalis. Uh, we train their employees to understand the work ethics in the United States of America. Um, things like punctuality, things like, you know, being on time, um, and so forth. 
and so many. Of course, I, I was a peace study when I went here, so we do a lot of um, conflict uh, management in the workplace. Uh, we, med we mediate between um, employers and employees. We also train the employers about Islam, why people have to pray, um, and also uh, we share uh, insights and, and give them recommendation as to you know, how they should give their employees a, uh, a reasonable accommodation uh, during the Ramadan and so forth. So we do a lot of uh, work with the community, um, and of course I also teach. Um, when it comes to assimilation and integration, though, they're not the same thing. Somalis are not um, um, open to leaving what they value, things like um, faith, um, their, their, their traditions, their culture, but they're also interested in becoming a part and integrating into the mainstream by going to schools, learning the English language, working, being a good citizen, paying taxes and so forth. I would like to read um, one of my interviewees code. Um, I don't know how much time I have, but I'll be real quick. Um, one of the Somali uh, interviewees that I actually talked to, his name is Ahmed Ali, and he's the lead staff organizer of the Greater Minnesota Worker Center. And he said, when he was talking about assimilation, um, this means we can retain the best of our identity while celebrating the best of the new culture. I can be a law-abiding American citizen while being a Muslim and a Somali person at the same time. I can fully participate and be able to contribute to the community politically and economically. So you can see um, the young folks are interested, not only interested in, but we're working so hard to um, adapt and become a part of this beautiful community. And that's why um, I want to share this with you because we are Americans just like anybody else. I always tell people we are not going anywhere. Um, so I hope, I hope we can come together and work together and build bridges and learn from each other because what I do think um, is that we just don't know um, some of, uh, maybe people don't know the Somali culture and the fear of unknown exists. And I do think if we come together and get to know each other and meet people, the fear of unknown will disappear. Thank you. Thank you, Huda. Uh, before I welcome uh, Jama, I would like just to say one thing from Huda. Uh, she is the one who encouraged me to join St. Ben's and St. John's University. So I would like to thank her. And I know where I am today and where I will be tomorrow. Uh, I would like to welcome Jama uh, Ali Mahat. He is an elder in St. Cloud, Somali community, and a, and a site manager of the La Cruz uh, Community Center in St. Cloud. He is also well known in St. Cloud. Uh, even those young kids who are in kindergarten know him because he is doing a good job in the community in, in St. Cloud. So, Ali, welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to come to a university and give a speech. Uh, I excuse myself. My English is not that good, like my Huda. And Adi. They are that you can see the difference of generation. We, have, we will have a young folks that. They came in America, they study, they did their job, and they are succeeding. And that's my pride. That's what uh, makes me feel really good about being here and living this life. Uh, I have to thank Professor Rambanyuko. He is uh, the one that works tirelessly, really, to do good in this community. He helped us a lot as a Somali community here, 
as an immigrant, uh, pushing us to a limit to where we want to go, looking after our kid, looking after our community, and we feel really appreciate what you do. Thank you. Go. Go on. Uh, I want to tell you one thing. I, I'm an old man. I, I'm an elder. Uh, and I'm proud to be a nomad. I'm a nomad guy. Nomadic people, as you know, we travel from one place to another, to another, to another. We wander the world. Uh, that gives us the strength to go in a place, settle, and be part of that place. We don't fear the unknown. We like to challenge the unknown. We came in a place, we settle, we build, we thrive, we do good. And that's the nature of the Somali population. That's uh, impeded in my life. I can go anywhere and start over. I know that people go to struggle. We, we lost a country that was a paradise. We are rebuilding now. But I can assure you, after we lost everything, was not the end of the world. You can lose. It's a God-given uh, things that you, you can have, you can lose. Today you have everything. Tomorrow you can have nothing. Look at what's happening in Florida today. Look at what happened in Texas. We people that build their life, that they have all the livelihood that they want, that they work hard, and they lose everything. That's life. But you don't have to crumble on that. You don't have to cry. You have just to get up, stand, and get back to your feet. Trust in God, trust in yourself, trust in the possibility that you can do. That's what we did. That's what our kids are doing. We are going back to life. So we call Central Minnesota our home today. St. Cloud, Wade Park, this area. We are, this is this our home. So when I say that this is our home, we are here to build. We are here to stay. We are here to become a real citizens of this country. And there is no way, no way, that we can accept to be marginalized in any way. We are part of the society. We are your brothers and sisters. We are the future of this country. So we are teaching our kids to build, to be strong, to adapt, to integrate and not assimilate. We wanted them to keep their culture, keep their religion, keep the good things that make them different. At the same time, be part of the society, be part of the community. I, I love to, I, I, was, I, was, I was in a, in a, in a, a sartel where they made a intercultural things and there was a German, there was a, a Finnish, there was a, a Irish, and they were showing all the difference that, they, that we have, food, a costume, life. And we have our table as a Somali, and that was beautiful. We have a Pakistani, Bangladesh. That's the, that's the beauty of America. That's the beauty, that's what makes America, America. Myself, I get introduced for, to the United States at very young age. You know through who? Through the Peace Corps. That was the strength of the United States in whole the world, where we can study, they teach us in a rural area, very remote area. That soft power of the United States was the strength of America, that built people, that show where the flag of liberty was. Today, the world is different. Instead of seeing of seeing the Peace Corps, we are seeing drones hovering over, over people. And people are called casualty. So that's the difference. When America projects 
the power, the soft power of America touches hearts, builds people, builds connection, builds what America is, projects the power, the real power of the United States. But the hard power that hurts doesn't build. So I wish that we can have back the projection of the soft power of the United States around the world, where we can hold proudly the flag of the United States and say, this is America. That's it. Here in, the, in, in this area, we are rebuilding. We are building businesses. We are building, uh, we are thriving. We are doing good. We are taxpayers. And we work hard. Really, we work hard. I used to work 120 hours per week. So I was working on two full-time jobs and doing overtime. That's the life that we did to give to our kid what they needed to succeed. I have two beautiful daughters. One is in China, at the university in China. The other one, she goes to a technical college. And that's what, what we are looking for. We are trying to build them to be a, a, a successful citizens. So uh, I think that uh, what we need is your support. All depends on you. You have, you have to give the opportunity to the newcomers. Every one of you, I think, came from somewhere, somewhere around Europe, somewhere around the world. So you came here, you became an American, okay? You, at one time, your parent or your grand-grand of your grand-grand, they were immigrants just like me. And if you look at the history, they were push and pull, push and pull. So today that you are enjoying to be the owner of the land, as a, this is a Christian school, right? So as a Christian, that is the doctrine of the Christian world to welcome immigrants. So I, I'm looking forward to, to be part of this community and to build, and thank you. Uh, thanks, Jama. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Tammy Wilson, a principal of Discovery School in Wade Park. Out of Through My Eyes, a child, a children's book about Somali refugee girls and her family and friends. Tammy, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say that it's a privilege to be here. And I also, um, before I get started, I want to say I appreciate our partnerships with St. Ben's and Discovery Community School. We work with students on every grade level, and they provide amazing opportunities for our students. So thank you for that. Um, so four years ago, I moved up to St. Cloud when I was offered a principal position at Discovery Community School. Little did I know how life-changing this would be for me. Before I moved up here, I heard from others stereotypes, biases, um, saw some things on the news. That was my experience with the Somali community. So thankfully, I suspended judgment because I just didn't know the community yet, and I wanted to take the time to get to know them. As soon as I moved up to St. Cloud, the Somali community was the first to welcome me into their community. They invited me to the Islamic Center to share food and to get to know their, um, their students, their families. It was a beautiful experience. Um, so a woman that I didn't even know, we don't always understand each other, but we um, communicate through smiles. Um, it was the middle of the year, and one of um, her child was moving to another um, school. And so I was giving him words of encouragement, and she pulled a beautiful scarf out of her purse, wrapped it around my neck, and we hugged. We didn't have the words, but we were able to communicate. 
That's been my experience with the Somali community from day one. So these generalizations and biases and stereotyping that I had heard were so untrue and it frustrated me and it bothered me. And so another piece was um, the year before I had come, we had over 100 Somali students come to our school. And our students, even our teachers, even though they're amazing, they really weren't sure how to teach these students with the language barriers. And so there were a lot of big shift classrooms in the media center, and there was a lot of small groups, and they were teaching them the language and doing the best they could. Um, so I've done a lot of things to transform the school, to have all of our students represented. Um, our library, if you walk through it now, it's beautiful, it's colorful, it represents all of our students. Our classrooms represent our students on the walls. I've hired six bilingual Somali staff, so our students, when they walk down the hall, they could see themselves represented through the personnel as well. And my first year at Discovery, I also thought it's important for every one of our students to see themselves represented in literature. So I went into the media center just to pull out some books for my Somali students because I didn't see any, and there weren't any. So then I went online and I thought I'll just order some books for my students. So I went online and I started looking through the internet, through Google, and I couldn't find one book for my students, not one. And when I heard from my teachers saying, I wish we knew our students better so we could serve them better. The best way to know my students is to talk with them. So students would come into my office and we'd have lunch together and I would just say, tell me your story. And they had the most amazing stories. They told me of trials and tribulations, how they left war-torn Africa and landed in the United States. And they had so much courage. So I created this book for my students so they can see themselves represented. That was my first why. I also wanted my staff and the community to understand the Somali community better. So that was my second why. And I think my learning curve went up more than anybody's through the whole process. And it's been more amazing than I could have ever imagined. The things that I've learned and what I was able to put into the book, the messages, I, have, I still have people coming to me on a regular basis saying, I didn't know that I've learned. Even my recess monitor, my lunchroom monitor said, I had no idea that they would have to stand in line in the refugee camp. I will look at my students differently now if somebody budges in line. I won't send them to the very back and I'll understand if, if they get upset because they might think they're not going to get fed. So that was very helpful. And after the book was written and it was in our library, a young man held it very high in the air, walking through the media center. There's a book about me. And he was so excited. He goes, and it talks about my religion. And the more I learn and the more I'm able to share, it's amazing how much we are more alike than different. The first part of the book talks about the pillars, and it talks about Islam. And when I share stories about God, and Christians believe in God, Muslims believe in God, they call him Allah, and they read the Bible as well as the Quran, people are shocked. It's really not that much different. Islam stands for peace. So when we hear stories on the news about ISIS and radical Islam, again, there's people generalizing, Islam stands for peace. So that ISIS and the radical Islam, that's got nothing to do with religion. It's about power and terror. And so, and then after I wrote this book, somebody from um, Edweek came out and they filmed me doing a roundtable discussion with my students that inspired me to write it the year before. And when I was talking to the students, I said, so what do you think the reader will get? And one girl said, they will understand that we're more alike than different and that we want to be friends and we just want to get along. So after this book, um, but before I go on, I just want to hold it up for a minute. Because I think this was just meant to be, things that fell into place. When I was talking about painting my media center, colorful, um, vibrant colors, 
Jill Double D. Kuhn is an artist, and she be painted beautiful murals in my school. So I said, Jill, um, I'd like you to be my illustrator. And she said, sure. So she created these beautiful illustrations on the cover and throughout the book, and that just helped the words come to life. So thank you, Jill, for that. Beautiful. So I discovered I like to write. <laughs> Um, and so I just completed my second book in, in a trilogy. It's called Rise Above Fear. The characters in their first book are now seniors in high school, and they're talking about college plans, and they're facing things that are going on in the world. Uh, Muhammad becomes the main character, and he learns to stand up for himself and explain and talk about what he believes in. And there's a lot of things in the story that happen in a typical high school you can just imagine. Um, but it's another book about learning and being who you are meant to be in the face of what society dictates. You should be, look like, act like. It's about being true to yourself. And I just wanted to add, um, what I've noticed is that when people make decisions based on fear or they act, react out of fear, they don't get good results. With fear, it's pretty difficult to develop trust or have peace. Fear causes divisiveness that increases violence. It can result in intolerance and hate. This is how I see our, saw our world if people act out of fear. I believe that it's each and every one of us has a responsibility to view each other through a lens of love, or at least empathy. If someone is struggling, instead of saying it's his or her problem and not yours, have empathy for that person. As a human being, it's not okay to see another person suffering and not care. We must rise above fear and care about each other. And it really comes down to get to know people as individuals. And my second book, I just finished with uh, a paragraph called Beautiful Mosaic, and I'm gonna um, end with that. The United States of America has been described as being a melting pot. Who really wants to change who they are fundamentally in order to assimilate into a culture that society dictates? When I think of melting, I think of becoming one. We are individuals. Everyone needs to bring their uniqueness, individuality, and gifts while holding on to what's true to one's culture, religion, and customs. There's nothing more important than living one's truth and being the best version possible. Each and every one of us brings our whole selves as we join each other to create a beautiful mosaic. And the more colorful the mosaic, the more beautiful it is. After all, we are connected as one human family. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Diana Amchain to speak. We're going to sit here so that we can kind of work together. <laughs> I'm Diane de Vargas, and this is Jane Leitzman. Um, and we are uh, part of this community. Over a year ago, at the request of uh, Jeannie Wilkins, pastor from Resurrection Lutheran Church, and my husband and I from St. Joseph's Catholic Church in the community, we were uh, told about six, six families who lived in our St. Joseph community and who were Somali, and they wanted us to go and start meeting them and uh, to find out what we could do. The number actually grew to be about 40 in the apartments on Cedar and First, and we don't have any definite numbers, but that's our kind of our ballpark figure. Centennial Park, across from Centennial Park, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we have about nine uh, families, and then on Iverson, uh, at the end of college, we have about four families in the townhouses there. Actually, the navigator at Kennedy School holds the key to who really is there because he has all the information on the families 
with the, the children who go to the school. The first person we ever met was Bashir, and I'll never forget when he told us that his family had come from the refugee camp just two months before we met him. Their 10 children, all 10 children, were born in the refugee camp. He was so excited to be here. And I asked him, how did he even know how to use the conveniences, such as the flushing toilet and running water and the stove and refrigerator, which they had never had? And he said that the manager showed them how to, to use everything. Can you imagine? How did they furnish their apartment? Family and friends normally help gather the items that the family needs. They start with nothing but hope for a better life. Bashir and his family have since moved to St. Cloud, where their other family members live, and where he is closer to schools, uh, stores, and transportation. Can you imagine going to Russia to live there and to have to call your internet company and try to figure out a problem? And you begin hearing in Russian the directions to press one for this and two for that. I get frustrated with that in English. Well, one of the women that I was helping was in that situation. So I listened for her and helped her through that because her young children were too young to figure that system out as well. St. Cloud has been enmeshed in working with the Somalis for the last 15 to 20 years. So we have resources there. We didn't want to start over. We've been asking them questions, how to do this, how to do that. Ron and his group and CMCEO has adopted us so that we're part of their staff, which has been immensely uh, helpful. If you can imagine these Somali people who live here in St. Joseph, they have to get to a doctor. They need to learn the English language. They don't have a car available. We've gone through that. We don't have bus service here. Some of the students have had that problem as well. We have learned about TriCap uh, bus service. We are working with them to make it possible, more possible, for our families here to be able to commute back and forth to the larger metropolitan area. How do we communicate with them? That's probably one of the biggest hurdles that we encountered. We have young college students in the Somali families that believe that they will most help their families by communicating with us and getting our information over there so that they can use that to become part of our community. Abdirazak Jama, a student from St. John's, was sent to us from Ron's group, CMCEO, to help out. He has been our guide for the last year. He was teaching us that the Somalis don't want handouts. They need to learn how to become independent in the United States and to contribute to their country. This has been an invaluable lesson for us to learn, that we are here to help them, not to show them how to do it, but to work with them in attaining their goals. We have learned that some of the other Somalis do not know their own written language because it was just introduced in 1972. So learning English was not only difficult, but learning how to form letters and numbers. Numbers they had pretty well, but the letters were a difficulty. As I met more in the community here, I found the people I spoke with as intelligent and eager to learn. They know their rules. They know the rules of driving, the rules of living in an apartment. They know that these are very important to them, and they take them seriously. Families help one another with no hesitation. I watched a brother come over to help his sister, who was short of funds at that moment and needed to pay a bill, took out his, his bank card and paid the bill with no hesitation. And I know she does that for him as well, whenever he has the need. 
Many of the St. Joseph Somalis cannot get to St. Cloud for English classes. Some of them need 40 hours of class to qualify for some jobs. With the help of the St. Cloud School District, we were able to start a daytime class last spring. What a wonderful experience. Just learning to introduce yourself and ask someone their name can be a lot of fun when you have wonderful volunteers to assist. And we have some very special people here in St. Joseph. Everyone knew someone's names, and one of our assistants didn't show up. The Somalis would ask where the person was. They, they noticed that he was missing. In the winter, especially, it isn't always easy for them to get just to the class, so across the highway and then into uh, the spirituality center where we are conducting the classes at this time. The sisters have invited us. Uh, free of charge, a uh, beautiful classroom and some other rooms that we use on occasion. A young co a college student, Anissa, over at the Cedar Trails Apartments, has been helping us to connect with people in her community who need to learn English. She has been willing to knock on doors and collect names and phone numbers. The school district will assess these people to learn at what level they need to learn English, and they will track their hours and provide class materials. The sisters know they are welcome anytime to come in and meet our students. We have even had social gatherings in order to teach and observe special American occurrences, such as birthdays, which the Somalis don't celebrate. We all brought food to share. If there is a problem and one student can't make it or they don't have a car, a young College student, Hoden, also a resident at Cedar Trails Apartments, will call us and let us know that they need a ride. One of our volunteers will go and pick them up. We are working this year to connect them with TRICAP and see if we can make this much easier on them and, and help them with the funds. Although it is cheaper within the St. Joseph area, we don't want their coming to school to be a burden on them financially either. Many of the parents have three or four children under five years of age. If the seven students who are signed up for our class were to leave the children with another family, that could possibly total 28 little ones plus babies. Their apartments are just too small. We need to find the space and people who are willing to help go, go through a background check and take care of these little ones during the classes so that more can come. One of the members of Cultural Bridges had to ter temporarily stop working outside her home with them because her husband needed her 24 hours a day to help him through his illness. Several of the Somali people from our community came over to her home and brought food and their prayers to help them out. If you think about how connected we become from being able to meet at our church or have an opportunity to meet here at the college or at City Hall, Think how it would be if you're a large community and have no place to meet. With eight to 12 living in an apartment, there isn't enough space for the community to meet in an apartment. The Somalis at Cedar Trails live right next to a park building at Wobegon. However, one has to pay a fairly steep price to rent the building just one time. There is no place to come to pray. Those who can go to St. Cloud and the men of the community go to the apartments to teach where children are gathered to learn the Quran. This year, six of our Somali women participated in helping in the community garden here at the monastery. Next year, they hope to plant their own food. It is difficult for them to find jobs here in St. Joseph, where they live. We are striving to connect them with employers who can use their skills with limited English. It is heartening to hear some of the women say that they like it here and they want to stay. It is sad when we have to say goodbye to a friend who moves back to St. Cloud. But unless our community is willing to sit down with the Somalis and listen to them and work with them to figure out solutions for their needs, such as a place to pray, we will see more and more of them move away and will lose their laughter and their caring hearts. We will lose a wonderful extension to our St. Joseph community. 
If you want to help, please give us your name and email or phone number after this conference. Now Jane is going to add her area of helping with the Somalis. Thank you. Um, initially, first we just have to start like Diane. I just must first say what a privilege this has become. And I feel so inferior to and so in awe of the women that we work with. They are just incredible human beings that I think, oh my gosh, what you have accomplished. I am so unworthy next to you. But that aside, um, I was invited to join in these visits first through the partnership in St. Joe and a, rep, a book club in a connection to Jeannie Wilkins. And as we were doing the visits, um, the obvious things you think of, you know, are, are checked off right away. We have plenty of school supplies. We have warm clothes. We have all those things that, that we need to get along here. So how do we help you assimilate and become familiar with some of those cultural things that you need. Um, one of the questions that I asked one of the people in the visit was, do you feel a need for simple help with homework after school? And we think about um, students coming home with planners and assignments and the need for signatures to households that don't speak English. That was acknowledged, yes, that would be a very helpful thing to have. So we started to think about how to um, pull this together. And I went to the head of the education department at the time, Janet, and said what our idea was and um, what can we do. So it, didn't, it took about a month to get to the point where we had a classroom scheduled. We started and have had invaluable help from the education department. We started with um, working through the Ed Club and getting connected to um, students who are interested in providing this after school help. And that grew. We got more students from Ron. And so we began, and we're still working through the clinks. Uh, there are days that nobody came, and we had lovely visits with our tutors. And there have been a couple of times that we had 16 come. And we sort of have a setup that um, depending on the group will stay, well, who has math and who has this and who has that will break into groups. Um, we found it's, it's pretty interesting as a retired teacher to find that there are some things that are pretty universal. We have a very spirited, delightful kindergartner that one time I just put on my lap and said, Honda, you have three left. You can get down when they're finished. And um, there is a mention we get when we get finished with the homework, there is um, a variety of things that we provide to do as well as it's pretty popular to let's go to the book room. And like children everywhere, who gets to carry the key and open the door is significant. And sometimes we have to figure out how we're going to take turns doing that. And it might not come as any surprise that brown bear, brown bear, what do you see is a very popular choice when the work is done. Uh, but we do have a variety. We also have high school students that will come to um, seek assistance in algebra and math. And we definitely have to turn that one over to our high school students or our college students that are the tutors. Um, I, just back to the elementary, um, again, people, one student I can think of in particular will maintain, no, I'm all done. I don't have any other homework. And David will go through his planner and discover, oh, but it doesn't say this is finished. Oh, yeah, well, we don't. But then they will go in another room or to another table where some one-on-one -on -one will get that, that piece of work finished. Um, we started out with 12 CSBSJU students and four adults from the St. Joseph community working with them. In the spring, we went to 13 and five adults. Um, I think some very special times to share. I, one cold day, um, David said to two women who stayed with their children, we should have tea for you. And so lamented that we were sorry we didn't. The next time they came, they had two carafes of Somali tea and sambusas. 
and were very disappointed that David was not there that day and sent me with a number of sambusas on a plate that were to come home to him. And he did get them, by the way. I only took a couple on the way home. <laughs> so we have many opportunities for um, working in that capacity. It's very rewarding. Um, we're very fortunate to be close um, in the same building to the curriculum library because there are times when I confess I do have to go get the third grade manual to figure out exactly how things are being set up and it's very nice to have that there. Um, it's also much more often than we'd like to think in a vocabulary lesson we think we've come far and we have but there might be three things that are just out of familiarity and so there is just to find a way to explain what that is and how it relates to something else. But it couldn't be a more rewarding thing at the moment. We're kind of tied by the student schedules and the availability of classrooms to 4.30 to 6. And, you know, that's kind of flexible on either end. Sometimes we don't leave there until about a quarter after 7. And um, so it's it's all fine and a very exciting, rewarding process. But we hope to grow and see what other things that we can continue to provide and thank you. Uh, now we came to the end of our session, but before uh, I would like to thank everyone who participated or attend this uh, ceremony. Before we go, uh, I would like uh, to throw the ball to your side now to ask questions, or if you have any question, you can uh, ask any question, anybody have a question? I work with the African Women's Alliance in St. Cloud, and we are finding a dramatic increase in the number of Somali women who are attending our sewing program. And we're in trouble because many of them don't speak English. And I don't speak Somali. And we're trying to communicate. We're looking for teachers and resources. How do I connect with a larger community to make this happen? I think we have maybe 20, 28 Somali women that are registered in the program. And uh, it's, it's really difficult to explain how to make an elastic casing when you have no language. So. OK, thanks for your question. Uh, I, know I cannot answer all the questions, but and I'm not going to answer any question. But the question goes to certain people, and I will give Chama to ask, answer that question. There's a, there's a way that you can do. Uh, there are places that, uh, that offers uh, classes, English classes, uh, with the help of the school district. So we have classes that goes in La Cruz, La Cruz area. We are doing classes in the morning and in the afternoon. Uh, so we have four classes going on that area. There is uh, another class that come, is, is coming up at the outpost uh, at the Boys and Girls Club nearby the Boys and Girls South, South side. There are uh, uh, at the library, at the uh, Riverside Library, we have classes going on in that area too. Uh, there are classes that go on uh, at Discovery. We are doing classes. So uh, there are classes going uh, in Wade Park area at Eagle. Uh, there are classes going on uh, uh, at, at the Troy, at the it's more stream mall, uh, cross, cross, not cross road mall. Uh, where uh, there are uh, classes going on 
in at the nearby the Ter Ter, uh, uh, close to that area. And there's a class going on at, uh, in St. John's. So there are plenty of opportunity for those women to go register in one of those classes and they can have help. So just uh, the, what you are missing is the resource. Where are the resources? So try to identify those resources and tell them and they can, we can, we can help in that way. Thank you. Do you know Rianda Sadil from Hands Across the World? If I see you after this, I can give you her information because she has done the same thing in teaching them how to sew because it's led them to jobs. And uh, she can give you some pointers and maybe give you some people as resources. OK, anybody with another question? If you have a question, please raise up your hand. Somali agency. If, uh, that, if, if there is a Somali agency or, or a place where um, you know people can go there and, and ask for um, resources, you know, for a Somali person, for example, is there an agency? Uh, well, it depends what you're asking, but um, we do have a company that um, is uh, based on or it, it, we are located in Saint Cloud. Um, it's called Filson Consulting. So um, I am the president. We have the, our VB is also sitting in the audience. So if you want to talk to us after this, we can. Uh, we have relationship uh, with the community, and we can connect you to the right people. Uh, we are consultant. We're not nonprofit, but again, we have a lot of resources in the community that we can connect you if you are interested in knowing some of those resources. Annette. Yeah. In, in many years of teaching, I have found goodwill white students who are also very shy and who don't want to make a mistake, which often keeps them silent rather than engaged. Could you suggest a couple questions that would be appropriate for a student to ask of a, of a, of you, Huda, for example, or to, so that we could begin that conversational process? Um, and overcome the silence that's, that's goodwill but right. Um, uh, of course. I mean, you know we're Minnesotans, so Minnesota nice, right? So we don't want to offend the people. So we're going to be like, you know, hey. Um, well, I literally have, I have a lot of questions or, or, you know, answers or suggestions and so forth. And I would love to meet with these students individually and see who uh, uh, they're working with. Uh, but I would ask, uh, you know, I will tell the students to, to basically ask questions. Um, start with the person, you know, what's your name? Um, what do you like to do? I mean, we do have young generations who are just like Americans, you know, American kids. Um, so... I don't have a particular question in, in my head right now where I can say, well, these are the questions that they should ask, but ask the, the things that you don't, don't know. Don't assume that you understand or you know what they're going through, but ask. Um, I work with a lot of students. Um, Hoden, you mentioned Hoden. Um, Anissa also is one of my mentees. I have a lot of uh, Somali uh, American students at the St. Clair Technical Community College you know, both boys and girls, and they too, um, I've been there, done it, so there were times where I was in a class, I was the only hijabi and, and, and a black person in the classroom, although I was smart, I, was, I knew what I was reading, I didn't have that, you know, confidence to speak up in the classroom and ask questions, um, so I know when uh, our students uh, from CSPSJU are going to those um, homes, or community and they're trying to uh, t tutor for students, um, the things that I want them to understand is that these people are smart, but they might not be able to speak the language. They might have a lot of self, you know, a lack of self-confidence. If they're girls, they might not ask questions because they think they have an accent. They will make a mistake that, you know, they don't understand what they've read. So there are so many things that will be going through their minds. So instead of just assuming that they understand their, or understood their homework that they read, I would ask you to please ask. Keep asking. 
you know, and 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 don't um, assume that they understand or know their material. There are times where you talked about, and they may not even know <laughs> um, that they have a homework <laughs> because the system is so different and it's so hard for them to maneuver through the American system, especially the education system in America. Um, I had a, a, a student in my office just last week and um, his first year, he came to me and said, I'm so f terrified to talk to my teacher. And I said, why? And he goes on to say, well, I missed three assignments. And um, he wasn't confident enough to send an email because, again, he thought, I don't know how to write, right? So um, and I said, OK, so do you check your D2L? Here we used to say Moodle, I guess. Do we still call it Moodle? Moodle? OK, cool. Cool. So I said, OK, let, let's log into your D2L. And I you know, checked his classes and all the assignments. And the guy doesn't even understand what syllabus means. And I'm like, what? Week four? And you don't even know what syllabus means? It, what about the teacher? Did they talk about Did she talk about it? Or he, whatever that person was? And he said, yeah, 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 uh, but I don't understand. So I had to literally you know, sit down with him and explain what the syllabus was and showed him what he was, you know, supposed to do, the homework. That, and then I drafted an email for him and say, go to your D2L, go to your email, you know, just say new email, you know, type this <laughs> and see what the teacher says and come back and let me know. And uh, he came back the next day and said, yeah, the teacher said that she will, you know, this time she will let me, you know, do two of the three. And I was like, that's amazing. But you know what? Let's go to the writing center. So I help him get a tutor and make sure that he, you know, understands what he needs to do. So sometimes students may not understand. Um, they're new to the country. They don't have friends. And one thing I find out is that the Somali young Americans, those who might or maybe were born here, they don't want to help. Sometimes, not all, but sometimes, OK? Sometimes. Um, they're advanced. They will come to class. They have work to do. Will come, go to class, take their you know, classes, everything done, and then they will go. So we have a, a lot of students who are new. They're sitting you know, at the writing center or tutor center. Uh, we have, you know, with the Technical and Community College, we, we're not like CSPSJU, so we don't have uh, a lot of you know, staff who are sitting and people. We, we do need a lot of people helping. So what I'm going to say is that don't just assume. Ask questions. Um, ask them to show you their um, homework if they do have a, you know, um, schedules or two, two or three weeks schedules. I don't know. Schools are different. Um, especially if you're working with young um, Somalis, please ask. <laughs> Uh, because they won't tell you much if they're new, especially if they're new to the country. Um, they don't have that, again, confidence that I talk about. So, so I don't have a particular advice for you, but I know um, I myself was there. I was a, you know, a part of those students that I'm talking about. Um, I want to go back and say one thing before I finish this. I remember um, several years ago when I was a student, at, especially you know, at the Technical and Community College, um, I took all my anatomy and physiology. Y'all know anatomy and physiology is not English, right? I mean, English is English. You talk about Latin and Greek words, forget about it. It was so hard. So I would study at night, you know, and I bought a light bulb because I was living with my siblings and we only had two bedrooms, so we had to share, right? So I didn't have a, a proper place or space where I can focus. So I used to, you know, use my, our, our closet, you know, so I, I shared a room with my, my, my sister Marianne, and I will go into the closet and I, I got my light bulb and I will study there at night until 4 or 5 a.m. and I had flashcards and read and read and read and read and read until I get it. So um, of course I got accepted both here and uh, the dental uh, program at the Technical and Community College at that time. And the students weren't comfortable. I don't know whether they were uncomfortable or they knew each other. Sometimes they they don't want it to study with me. So I felt so isolated in the classroom. So what happened was that I said no to, to that um, invitation to come to the information session. So now, when I got hired 2015, I had to go back 
and shared my experience with the president, President Joyce Salins, and I told her what I experienced while I was a student at the CS, you know, uh, at the Central Technical Community College. She hired me, and I have been working with those students. I recruited five Somali, um, um, I think some of them are Americans, young women to, to our college. They got accepted into the dental program for the first time as a young Somalis cohort. And now um, they started this fall and hopefully will graduate in two or three years. So we have to understand um, the culture is totally different. The students, even though they might be bright, uh, they might be intelligent, they might have the right support at home, if they don't see themselves represented in the classroom, if they don't have teachers who look like them, if they don't have friends in the classroom, they might not move forward. They might not have that confidence um, to even come out of, the, of those fears and, and ask questions. So please be aware of um, those things that I just talked about. And if you ever need um, help or if you wanna ask me questions, I would love, 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 love to work with you. And I'll give you my cards um, after this, so. Also, I think over time, you might find that you build up some communication with the teacher as you work with the students. On more than one occasion, I have written a note right in the planner saying, I'm a little confused about this, but here is what we did. Um, and I have yet to get back a note saying, oh, you did it all wrong. I'm really irritated with you. Um, I think our college students form incredible bonds with these students. And the other thing is don't hesitate to do like I mentioned. Um, if there are several children in the room and they're in various stages of completion, it can be a lot more um, enticing to play than to do the schoolwork. You know, and sometimes you have to do like David does with Bashir, say, we're going here until this is finished and then you come back. But I, a lot of it is looking at that planner, interpreting, and if you don't get it quite right, you know, put a little PS and say, this is how we did it. And nobody's gonna be upset with you, I am very certain. Okay, uh, I will just like to add one more thing. Uh, do you have a question? I have a question. Do you think that at a conference like this, maybe more emphasis should be given to what's in the head and what's in the heart? I say this because I grew up in this country and I grew up prejudiced. I feel superior to black people. In my head, I know we're all equal. That's the philosophy. Because God made us all and there's no distinction. In my heart, it's different. And it seems like I have to take it step by step by step. To give you an example, when John mentioned, this is our home, that's the first time I heard someone say that the Somali people here are now at home. And it sort of shook me a little bit. And then I said, of course they're at home, why not? I had to process it in my heart. Not in my head, but in, in my heart. Not so long ago, I went fishing, and I had earthworms. Two, three Somali kids came, two boys and a girl, to watch me, and they were curious. And of course, I showed them the worm, and the boy wanted to put it in his hand. And then, of course, he wanted to put her into the girl band. And she said, no, 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 no. And the first time I saw little kids, just like our little kids, I said, they're just like us. Another time I saw three boys, maybe Somali, I think they were Somali, and they were going to zip the car, squeal the wheel. And I had to process that. Oh, they're like us. I'm thinking that in a peace conference like this, we have to process what's in the head. I have no problem with that, we're all equal. What's in the heart, I grew up in America, and we are prejudiced. And I think we have to treat them on different levels. Thank you. That's my question, shoot me. Um, 
Um, thank you very much for sharing that beautiful um, story because um, when I, before I came to the United States of America and when I was in Africa, um, it is, this is very interesting. I knew I was, of course, an African um, a Somali and we studied um, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity a little bit in the, you know, Muslim madrasa. It's like a Sunday, you know, school um, in Africa. And prior to coming to the United States of America, of course, I knew I was a woman and a Somali, maybe hmm, African, yes, uh, but never a black. So when I came to the United States of America, I had to learn that I was black. I mean, I thought I was African, but never black. And black in Africa is beauty, by the way. The darker you are, the better, right? So really, so sometimes, you know, we don't understand those stereotypes, those prejudices that you just talk about, the discrimination and all of that. We had to learn. And of course, um, I particularly, I don't know if you guys studied um, Martin Luther King, of course I knew uh, uh, Gandhi, uh, but we, we were never taught the American um, history per se, slavery and so forth. So those things are foreign to us. You know, I'm talking about the younger uh, Somalis, the ones who are either born after the Civil War or uh, the ones who are maybe about eight or nine or 10, because those folks are different than my moms and dads, right? Uh, because of the civil war and so forth. So um, I would definitely say we should um, open our hearts and minds to our neighbors, and we should learn from each other and reach out. Um, on August 26, we hosted um, uh, Dine with Your Muslim Neighbors dinner, and we did that because of the things that were going on in our community or still going on right now. There are a lot of people who think, you know, we came here to implement Sharia. No. Um, we are here to harm our neighbors. No. Um, we are here because we're the problem people. I don't think so. Um, we just need to know each other and get to know each other. And, and, and as Tommy said, uh, know people um, as an individual and understand where they're coming from. So um, a few weeks ago, I, I attended the city council in St. Cloud, and I met so many interesting people there, people who didn't understand why the Somalis you know, came here and have had prejudices, I would say, and were saying some things that were very hurtful. Um, Abdi and I were the only two Somali Americans sitting in the you know, city hall that day, and we tried to talk to them uh, personally, but they, they didn't want to listen. But um, what I believe is that people will listen to you if you talk to them in, a, you know, in a, like a human, humanity, humanity, right? Um, talk to people, um, share your stories. Stories are powerful. Um, tell them what had happened to you prior to you coming to, you know, coming to the United States of America and how you uh, uh, felt when you got here and your experiences in the United States of America because this is our home. We are safe here. Uh, we work here. Our community um, supports us to, to some extent. Um, there are a lot of amazing, phenomenal people in St. Cloud and, and St. Joe who are trying to bring the community together. So we're not working alone. But what I'm going to say is that, uh, and of course, Somalis also uh, don't understand the other immigrants as well, their experiences and and and, and struggles. So we are one community. We can... Um, help others understand our culture, our faith, and how we are not a problem to, uh, to our hosted community by talking to them, by sharing meal with people. Uh, I interned in Washington, D.C., and I remember um, people who were coming together. They were Jews, they were Christians, they were Muslims, uh, mostly women, uh, trying to build a peace and coexistence and, 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 and have that... Uh, you know, dialogue and, and dinners and, and tea and so forth. So knowing, knowing your neighbor will help you overcome that fear and prejudices and so forth, and that will help you open your hearts and minds. And I, and I have met people who have had those perceptions and, and, and prejudices before they met me. So I think it can be done if we can 
Let's get out of our comfort zone and reach out to the others. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we came to the end of our session. Uh, I would like to thank you all for you coming and sharing your precious time with us. See you again. Thanks, all. <laughs>